Hello friends, I am Arpit and I am here with today's analysis. Today is 17th of December and we are going to deal with three very important topics which are in news. The first topic is India's energy transition, the balance needed. Transition as the name suggests means change and energy transition means the change in the energy mix means earlier we were dependent more and more on fossil based fuels and now since the last 10 15 years we have you know increasingly focused on non fossil based fuels non fossil based fuels are renewable energy plus nuclear plus hydro where fossil fuels are not involved now why we have done this shift we have done this shift to conserve the environment we have done this shift to meet our intended nationally determined contributions and yes, India has contributed fairly in this. India's energy transition has been very rapid, very intensifying and has been, you know, applauded all across the world. India is the third largest producer of renewable energy right now. Around 40% of energy or 40% of electricity which is produced in India is from non-fossil based fuels. You know, earlier it was, you know, less than 20%. This intensified push towards, you know, adopting clean energy sources is facing or is met with certain challenges as well. You know, these challenges are intermittency, first of all, intermittency is, you know, uh, when you produce electricity by using solar or wind, it is dependent upon certain climatic factors like sunshine availability or the wind flowing. Now, if both of these factors are weak on a particular day, then electricity produced will be less. But the demand is the same and the demand is rising. How will you meet that demand? This is a big, big challenge. This challenge can be resolved by storage of electricity which is produced. But the storage infrastructure is presently not at that level which it should have been. Then, you know, how do we meet it? We meet it by, you know, producing electricity from coal-fired plants. Now, we keep these coal-fired plants at standby because, you know, uh, the electricity demand is being met by the, you know, non-fossil based fuel sources. But due to intermittency, challenges are there. So we meet those challenges by keeping or by you no know, enhancing coal based electricity generation this is something which we are focusing on now in november 2023 only the minister of electricity or minister of power simply said that we are adding up 87 gigawatts of capacity of coal fired plants because we need to you know manage the situation or we need to balance the situation that is why balance needed if we have to fulfill the demand so all these things we will be covering in this topic the second topic is the kashi tamil sangamam 2.0 kashi tamil sangamam 1.0 was held last year that is in 2022 november december and this year's that is the second version of kashi tamil sangamam is being held right now it starts today, that is 17th of December, and it is going to continue till 31st of December. Where, you know, students, scholars, or I would say uh, artisans, or, or uh, people from the NGOs and all, they will be coming and meeting from Tamil Nadu to Varanasi. That is what Kashi Tamil Sangamam is. What is the objective of this kind of people to people connecting event it is one of the basic objective is to revive the ancient ties between these two centers of learning of that time kashi which is considered to be one of the oldest cities on this earth and tamil that civilization is also very very old and these two old civilizations both in india fortunately had certain connects at that time and we want to revive those connects and with this hope that 
the problems which we are facing in the present day can be solved by those ancient solutions, those traditional solutions. So it is kind of a cultural connecting program which is aiming to revive the ancient historical connects between these two centers of learning. And the third topic which we are going to cover is Viksit Bharat Sankalp Yatra. The Viksit Bharat Sankalp Yatra is a yatra which is obviously done by the present government that is the BJP and it, it uh, aims to cover multiple uh, panchayats or uh, rural local bodies and multiple urban local bodies by January 26, 2024. What is the main aim of this Yatra? The main aim of this Yatra is to make people believe that we have to be developed by 2047. And how will we become developed? We will become developed if poorest of the poor get access to the schemes. The Prime Minister went on to say that this Viksit Bharat Sankalp Yatra is my test that have I delivered on these schemes or not to the people. He further went on to say that the people do, do not need to run after the government. It is the government which will come after you and deliver you schemes. It should be like this. The thing is that if we want to become developed by 2047, then you know these schemes should be delivered timely and in an effective manner. He took names of schemes like Pradhan Mantri Avas Yojana and went on to say that if Pradhan Mantri Avas Yojana as a scheme is there, then houses should be built. Houses with all the amenities which are promised, quality construction should be there and timely delivery of services should be there. Then only we will be able to become a Viksit Bharat that is a developed India by 2047. So all these things he was he has been talking about. So this topic we will cover and largely this topic is from the mains perspective not from the prelims perspective i would say you can use content from here in your answers to enrich your answers now india's energy transition the balance needed now if i talk about the last 10 15 years india's green push green push we can understand it in such a way that india's increased focus on green energy or renewable energy was very much i would say intensified we adopted or we we went on to install renewable energy at unprecedented rate and we have become the third largest producer of renewable energy all across the world 40 percent of the electricity generated in india right now is from the non-fossil based fuels non-fossil based fuels is a broad term see non-fossil based fuels is basically those fuels which are not fossil based like petroleum or coal. What they are? They can be renewable energy. Obviously they are non-fossil based. They can be nuclear energy. They can be, you know, uh, <coughs> the third is hydropower. Fossil fuels are not being used. But non-fossil is not equal to renewable energy. Aspirants, you know, equate it with renewable energy. No. Renewable energy plus nuclear plus hydro. Nuclear and hydro. Large hydro are, is not renewable. Okay. So it is like this. While India has consistently stepped up renewable capacity addition in the last few years, Policy makers have realized that the country, sim the country simply cannot keep adding more green capacity. We need to address the concerns related to the green energy or I would say renewable energy. Concerns like intermittency. Concerns like storage of power which is being generated. Then only the demand fluctuations can be tackled. Else tackling demand fluctuations will become difficult. Why? Because renewable energy generation is dependent upon climatic factors. The Union Power Minister, Mr. R. K. Singh, in a review meeting in November 2023, agreed to add 60 gigawatts of fresh coal-fired capacity power plants. Means we are going to add coal power plants. And already 27 gigawatt of capacity that is already under construction 
is there. So in addition to this 27, 60 gigawatt of coal fired power plants are being added. So this makes it 87 gigawatts of coal fired plants which are coming up in India. And you know what happened in COP28 UNF of UNFCCC recently? You know, there was a proposal that the countries should not add any, you know, coal fired power plants right now. This proposal was opposed obviously by India because in November only we have cleared this 87 gigawatts of additional coal power plant. And not only India, China and South Africa also opposed this. Because we need to balance this. Okay, we are, you know, intensifying our green push. But there are certain challenges also with respect to that. Challenges of storage, which requires lakhs of crores of rupees. And we do not have the money since we are developing. So we will be focusing on this. In line with this, India was among those countries along with China and South Africa who opposed a proposal. What was that proposal? That proposal was no new coal-fired power plants can be commissioned without an inbuilt carbon capture and storage facility. Carbon capture and storage should be there, capturing carbon from the atmosphere, sequestering it, taking it underground and storing it over there. Unless you have that facility developed, you cannot go for installing any coal-fired power plants. This was something which was a proposal tabled in the COP28 of UNFCCC, which was opposed by India and thankfully it did not get adopted. Now if I see sources of power in India, so this is thermal, this is the maximum, means coal. This is nuclear, very less, less than 10% it is, around 5-6%. This is hydro. This is renewable energy. So nuclear plus hydro plus renewable, these are what? Non-fossil. This is fossil. So India is the world's third largest producer of renewable energy right now. More than 40% of installed electric capacity comes from non-fossil fuel sources. And in our INDCs also, it is mentioned that around 50% we have to, you know, get it from there, from non-fossil fuel sources by 2030. So it can be reachable. Non-fossil fuels, nuclear, hydro plus renewable energy. Solar and wind capacity is now more than 30%. This is purely renewable, solar and wind. This green push has resulted in 24% reduction in emission intensity of GDP. Emission intensity is again a term. Now, I have told you that in order to develop, we need to do emissions. Let's suppose I make this pen. In the factory, I'll be doing some emissions. Once this pen is made, it will be transported from one place to the other place. Again, emissions. If, I, if someone is coming to buy this pen, then and, and using his or her own vehicle, then emissions. So developmental activities, if they are happening, emissions are inevitable, they will also happen. We need to understand it in this way. But now with this concept clear in your head, emission intensity will be easier to understand. To generate one unit of GDP, how much emissions are emitted? This is emissions intensity. Now in our INDCs, when we adopted in 2015-16 Paris Pact, the first ever INDCs when we submitted, one of the INDCs was reducing carbon intensity or emission intensity by 33 to 35% of 2005 levels. At that time, we kept this target for ourselves. And then when we renewed our INDCs in uh, 2021, that is COP26 in Glasgow, we said that 33 to 35% we are already reaching or almost there. Now we need to upgrade this. So we upgraded and said that we need to reduce the emission intensity or carbon intensity by 45% of 2005 levels by 2030. So coming to this, you know, 24% reduction in emission intensity from 2005 already happened in 2016. That is why we said 33 to 35%, you know, by uh, we will be doing it in our first INDCs and now 45%. So we are focusing on reducing 
emission intensity right from the very beginning so that is there but the challenges in transition those are the things which are not letting us purely adopt no non fossil based fuels or renewable energy right now this these are some things which are increasing our focus towards coal fired plants also see on one hand demand is there and it is rising in india india is the fastest growing economy of the world and to meet these demands you know electricity is a basic necessity but what if electricity's availability is intermittent that will definitely hamper development so in order to tackle this the government basically in november 2023 only has said that we are going to install more coal fired plants in order to balance this thing so that development also keeps on happening and our you know transition also keeps on happening it is like this now the lack of storage facilities these are important to counter the variability so batteries are required lakhs of crores of rupees have to be invested by 2031 32 in order to you know reduce intermittency intermittency is basically the second challenge now since renewable energy is dependent upon climatic factors like availability of sunshine or wind flow it is unpredictable on the other hand the demand is sustained which has to be met so this with intermittency we cannot meet the demand intermittency can be tackled by increasing storage facilities now to counter the problem of intermittency power utilities are forced to keep old thermal units on standby now since we cannot or we do not have the money right now to invest in in uh, you know storage capacities what we are doing is we are keeping coal fired plants on standby and to keep those coal fired plants on standby money is there because the fixed cost is there you have to pay the salaries you have to pay the i would say minimum bills of that coal fired plants everything you have to do so this is a big big challenge what should be done increase storage capacity the increased renewable energy thrust of last 10 years also met with a projected battery storage requirement in 2031 32 of 51 gigawatt and 84 gigawatts this much will be required and this needs lakhs of crores of rupees increased allocation of funds should be done so that this can be developed see with this i am not saying that we are not going to you no know, develop renewable energy we are moving away from renewable energy no we are creating a balance so that the demand is also fulfilled and on the other hand environment is also conserved but we need to go well prepared for both these aspects a mix should be adopted keeping in mind our indcs focus on rnd to minimize emissions from coal fired plants so whatever coal fired plants are existing you know emissions should be minimized apart from it we can also look towards you know carbon capture and storage facilities rnd in this domain innovation in non fossil based fuels innovation like storage and all the cost of that should can be minimized by innovative i would say methods and finally policy flexibility should be there the government should be proactive over here to understand and assess the demands of the situation so all these things should be done in order to keep the development running and keep conserving the environment now the kashi tamil sangamam 2.0 inauguration venue namo ghat in varanasi and you know starting today 17th of december till 31 of december this is going to happen nodal ministry is ministry of education who is hosting this event and other participating ministries ministries of culture tourism railways textiles food processing all these ministries will be promoting one district one product msme information and broadcasting skill development and entrepreneurship irctc and government of up 
are also participants in this event since this event is being held in Uttar Pradesh. So this is something like this. Now this temple you can see is I would say the northern style that is the Nagara style Kashi Vishwanath temple as it depicts and this is a Dravida style temple. The Kashi Tamil Sangama. Participants, students from various districts of Tamil Nadu, they were the first ones to come and their consignment or their batch was named after the river Ganga. This delegation is named after this river that is Ganga. Now every group of I would say delegation has been named after a river. So teachers, Yamuna, professionals when they will come from Tamil Nadu, they will be named after river Godavari, spiritual leaders, Saraswati. Farmers and artisans, Narmada, writers, Sindhu, Sindhu means Indus, traders and businessmen on Kaveri River. So this is what you know they have been named. Nothing I would say uh, connecting in that, but just a nomenclature given to these groups. Now the aims and objectives of this particular event. The overarching objective of this people to people connect program is to revive the living bonds between Kashi and Tamil Nadu, the two important centers of learning and culture in ancient India. It aims to bring these two traditions of knowledge and culture closer together while building an understanding of shared heritage and strengthening ties. And the third is rediscovering and strengthening the ancient intellectual, cultural, spiritual and artisanal you know, connect between these two centers of learning. So, in a nutshell, if I have to say, bringing together these two ancient centers of learning, Kashi and Tamil. Exchanges will be there, cultural exchange programs will be there, uh, and, uh, seminars will be there, cultural programs will be there where, you know, students or all these people will be showcasing, uh, you know, cultural objects like dance or, or, or uh, their objects which they make. All these things will be showcased in these days that is from 17th of December till 31st of December. During the 15 day long event, various cultural groups from Tamil Nadu and Varanasi will perform cultural programs in Kashi that is Varanasi. Now the Viksit Bharat Sankalp Yatra. Viksit Bharat means developed India. And this pledge was taken by our Prime Minister in his last year's Independence Day speech, that is in 2022. He termed this period, that is from 2022 till 2047, as the Amrit Kal, the 25 years in which we have to become a developed India. Development in itself is a very broad term. Development not only entails economic development, uh, per capita income should grow. That is something which is the basic necessity or basic requirement of being called as a developed country. But apart from it, you know, you know, people should be living in more hygienic spaces. People should be live, having a house, having access to clean drinking water, having access to good healthcare services, having access to good education, sanitation facilities should be there. Women should feel secure. There should be proper vaccinations. There should be a reduction in indicators like IMR or MMR. Then only we will be calling ourselves a developed country. Development is a very, very broad domain. And we need to broaden our canvas and write on that canvas or draw on that canvas our development story. So this Viksit Bharat Sankalp Yatra, it was launched by the Prime Minister on the birth anniversary of Birsa Munda. It aims to cover 2.55 lakh Gram Panchayats and 3600 urban local bodies. And the basic aim is to promote central schemes. This is what the fundamental idea is behind this. Because it is these schemes in which, you know, development for all, especially the poorest of the poor in the country is there. The government is able to deliver those schemes properly, timely, effect effectively, then, you know, the, the these problems of the poor people will go away. Problems like housing, problems like employment, problems like sanitation, 
बिकॉज फॉर ऑल दीज थिंग्स गवर्नमेंट्स हैव स्कीम्स लाइक प्रधानमंत्री आवास योजना फॉर हाउसिंग और द स्वच्छ भारत अभियान फॉर सैनिटेशन और और आई वुड से फॉर एम्प्लॉयमेंट महात्मा गांधी नेशनल रूरल एम्प्लॉयमेंट गारंटी एक्ट दैट इज एम जी नरेगा क्लीन कुकिंग फ्यूल्स वी हैव उज्ज्वला योजना और फॉर अवेलेबिलिटी ऑफ ड्रिंकिंग वाटर वी हैव दिस जल जीवन मिशन सो इफ दीज आर अवेलेबल इफेक्टिवली एंड टाइम लीड टू द पीपल डेवलपमेंट डेफिनेटली विल हैपन सो इट इज लाइक दिस द प्राइम मिनिस्टर बिलीव इंडिया विल अचीव डेवलपमेंट बाई टू थाउजेंड फोर्टी सेवन if its citizens commit to the goal pm modi said that people should encourage a spirit for development similar to the freedom fever that was prevalent during independence struggle because it was mahatma gandhi at that time who was successful in bringing all the people together for development so oh sorry for freedom so similarly now we have to come together for development in our country many government schemes have been made india's development story will depend on timely and effective delivery of those schemes to all the eligible beneficiaries he highlighted schemes like pm awas yojana and said that if there is this pm awas yojana then houses should be built he highlighted the fact that persons in modern government politics and social work are giving their time to make this yatra a success conclusion of this yatra will be on 26 january 2024 if the 140 crore countrymen take a resolve to make the nation developed then definitely india will be vixit by 2047 this is what he has been saying and you know on the other hand we have comments from noted economist like raguram raj that if india keeps on growing by 6% per annum then we will not be developed by 2047 because there will be an increased burden on us of population aging by that time population aging is a situation where a substantial portion of your population is in the non working age group that is in the elderly age group so that also we have to keep in mind the population dynamics by 2047 not only no delivery of services or delivery of schemes to the people there will be multiple factors which will simultaneously be at play and then only we will become a developed country this dream is you know not i would say a utopian dream definitely reachable but yes the efforts of one and all are needed the government the judiciary most importantly we the people if we collectively work towards this goal definitely we can be there so let's be hopeful in that so this is it from today's session i will be meeting you tomorrow now with more such informative news pieces till then you guys very well know what to do not repeating it today namaste jai hind